It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. Yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Behind the wheel of a classic car. <gasps> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. Oh. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. Doubled up there. There'll be worthy winners. £1,700. Yay! And valiant losers. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Will it be the high road to glory? Loving it, loving it, loving it. Or the slow road to disaster. <laughs> this is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> Groovy, baby. Buckle up and brace yourself for another rip roaring antiques extravaganza. We're in South Wales, travelling from Monmouthshire to Carmarthenshire with the ever-giggling chuckle chums <laughs> Tim Medhurst <laughs> and Izzy Palmer. <laughs> Look at that lovely wall there, all the lovely shrubs growing out of it and it's turned into a lovely rockery. Oh, I like a rockery. So I like a rockery. We're so rock and roll, aren't we? <laughs> we are. Our rockeries, <laughs> our antiques, our early nights, our scrabble in the evening. Our Horlicks before bed. <laughs> <laughs> this dangerous double act are driving a 1960s Fiat 500, which they've nicknamed Bumblebee. Bumblebee doesn't have a radio, but what music would you listen to? I think it's got to be pretty hip music, hasn't it? Yeah. We're always living our life on the edge, aren't we, Izzy? Hardcore antiques. <laughs> YOLO! <laughs> <laughs> Last time, Izzy started almost £600 in front of Tim, but she let her heart rule her head. I do like a sampler. I think I might take a punt on this one. At £30, we all in then. <laughs> Only two of her five lots earned a profit at auction. I'm going to bow out now before the humiliation gets worse. Tim was the comeback kid. A pair of Victorian spectacles, always useful. He spent his money wisely. 750 going twice, gavels up. And earned a big profit on his items. 750 pounds. That was a heck of an auction, wasn't it? I mean... It was incredible. Unbelievable. The pressure is now, I've got over 1,500 pounds, sorry to rub it in. I've got over 50... <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, I didn't quite hear so that. 1,500 pounds. I just don't know what I'm going to spend my money on. There's just so much of it. Well, Tim, I'm guessing more antiques. <laughs> they both started with £200, but now Tim's total stands at a very impressive, hefty £1,557.26p. Izzy may be in second place, but she still has the hefty sum of £770.14p in her piggy. We have both made incredible profits so far. I can't wait to see what we can do next. I've got some catching up to do, that's for sure. <laughs> Izzy's not got long to go to get back in front. This is the penultimate leg of a trip that began in the mountains of North Wales and is ending in the valleys of the south. Today's shopping spree will conclude in Newcastle, Emlyn, but we begin in Chepstow. Oh! The town is located on the River Wye, right next to the border with England. Why Emporium? Why indeed? I suppose we'll find out. What? Where? When? How? Who? Why? Uh, you've no need to worry, Tim. The Why Emporium has enough to keep you and Izzy busy. I like that look of that map. I'm going to be intrepid. Ooh. Careful now, Tim. Uh, let's get up here. That's really cool. Western region British Railways. Dated 1951. I think that's really cool. There's more maps, actually. There's a London and Suburbs Mainline Railways sign. Now, that is cool. Can you see that over there, that enamel sign? That's huge. <laughs> Tim's gone all Bear grills. Antiques action, man. That is amazing the railway taking on water sign. And the imagery there is very, very cool. If you're a, a train engine enthusiast, that is the sign for you. Tim's excited by the railway honour. Boss man Barry's the man with the prices and he's looking scared. I'm loving this enamel sign. It's got yeah. such a great look, but how much is it? 500 pounds. Oh, 
And also, how much are the maps? They're twenty pounds each. Twenty pounds. Okay, right. There's food for thought. I'm going to try and get down. Okay. And, good and luck. Carry on looking round. <laughs> Antiquing. What a doddle. This is quite interesting, actually. They're loving their maps, these two. There's some maps here, and they've clearly had some hand painting done to them. Hopefully, there's a date. The geological information published Feb 1845 by <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Colby of the Royal Engineer. This was before cars, so this would have been horses, horse and carts to get yourself around the country from one place to another. It's certainly before sat nav. Probably more accurate too. Ah. And what I really like about these is the fact they've been coloured and they're only priced at £15 each. So I could get the two for £30. <laughs> I think they're probably a yes, but I'm going to leave those there and go and see what else I can find. Welcome, viewers, to the launch of the new Antiques Road Trip mascot, Roger Rodent. Actually, I think this may be a rabbit. Roger Rabbit's already taken. Back to the drawing board. <laughs> Tim, is that you? Hello. <laughs> you all right? Uh, I can't quite take you seriously right now. Oh! That is hot in there. <laughs> I can breathe again. Oh, you look so hot. <laughs> Shall I hop off? Yeah, maybe. Good luck. See you later. See you later. <sighs> Tim's got all the time in the world for larking around, it would seem. But Izzy's got her antiques game face on. What this is, is a Victorian umbrella stand. You know, nice cast iron one. And what's lovely is you've got the mask head here, but... What's nice is it's got the original drip panel, drip tray, because if you've got your wet umbrella, you want to be able to catch all the water coming off it. But quite often, the, the pans aren't with the rest of the stand. It's priced at £85, now that's a bit more than I was hoping. I'm also just noticing, the more I look at it, that there is a bit of damage down here where things have rusted through. But I think to myself, that's not a bad thing necessarily, because hopefully that can be a bit of negotiating room. Can Izzy do a deal for the Victorian umbrella stand and the two maps with shopkeeper Hannah? The umbrella stick stand's priced at £85. It is. Basically, what's the very, very best you could do on it? How does £45 sound? That would be absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. So it's £45 for the stick stand and then £30 for the two maps, so that is £75. £75. Pounds. That's a deal. Hannah with a near identical hair has given Izzy a generous £40 discount on the umbrella stand and Izzy has paid the ticket price of 30 for the mats, leaving her with just under £700. I've always got to check if there's any coins hidden away anywhere and there are some here. But it's just finding out what they are. That's quite interesting. Little silver medal commemorating the 70th birthday of William Gladstone, who was Prime Minister during the 19th century. So just quite a nice little 19th century curio, isn't it? So beautifully engraved. It's dated 1879, um, and it's basically struck by Liverpool celebrating the 70th birthday of William Gladstone. Might be one to ask the price on. Barry? Barry, hi. Hi, how are you doing? doing? Um, how much is your medal? That one is £25. £25. That's a deal, thank you very much. Bargain. I'll pop it in my pocket. You put it in your pocket. I'll Crack carry on. on looking round. Good man. Thank you very much. There's plenty more to explore, and Tim has plenty more cash in his pocket. This has really caught my eye. I'm a big fan of decorative objects, and this is very decorative, but it's also quite historical as well. It's a cast iron sign, and it's the Motor Car Act 1896 and 1903 by the London and North Western Railway Company, Euston Station, London. And it says, notice this bridge is insufficient to carry heavy motor car, and there's basically areas here where you could put a little plaque with the different weights. So it's a decorative object. It'll appeal to people that are interested in early automobilia, early train memorabilia. It's priced at £265. And I've just felt something with my foot down here. That's interesting. What's that? 
that's also pretty cool. Look at that. It's a 19th century iron railway track clip and it's dated here by the looks of it 1888 it's been later painted to turn it into more of a decorative object so again it might tie in with the railway collecting and i'm thinking maybe the two together would be pretty cool that's quite an interesting lot so we've got 265 no price tag on this It'd be interesting to see what barry would do the two for tim's certainly keeping barry busy today now you've got the cast iron sign over there yes. and the railway clip. You've got 265 on the sign. I'm hoping we can get near the 200. Is that possible? Go on then, you caught me on a good day. 200? Let's do 200. Oh, you're a gent. You've got um, all these railway maps. How much are they um, as a group? They're 20 pounds each marked up as, so we could do five of them for 80. Brilliant, thank you. So that's 305. Thank you very, very My much. My pleasure. Tim will have his purchases boxed up and sent on. Thank you. He bought the railway sign and clip for £200, the maps for 80 and the medal for 25 leaving him with just over £1,250. So nice to say that. Here we go, little bumblebee. Let's go. Meanwhile, Izzy has travelled to the Welsh capital, Cardiff, to learn about a shameful event in the proud city's long history from historian Professor Mike Pearson. I absolutely love these docks. They're fantastic. When you look out now, it's difficult to believe that 100 years ago, this was the entrance to one of the great seaports of Britain. But it's also difficult to believe, perhaps, that this was also the scene of racial unrest. In the 1800s, Cardiff Docks was a major hub for coal and iron exports all over the world. And men came from India, North Africa and the Caribbean to work and live here. Cardiff had a very long-standing multiracial community, many different cultures, different races, a lot of intermarriage as well. By 1919, the multicultural docks area, known locally as Tiger Bay, was long established and harmonious. But that summer, large numbers of ex-servicemen demobbed after World War I migrated to Cardiff docks in the hope of getting work. Unable to find any, they remained in the city, unhappy that after years of military service, they were left destitute. Four days of violence erupted in which three people died and hundreds were injured. Two events seem to have sparked the riots. First of all, there was a street fight, some kind of altercation, when a man called Harold Smart staggered up to a policeman and said, I've had my throat cut uh, by a black man. And sadly, um, Harold Smart died. Uh, the second was the arrival at uh, the end of a day trip by a group of black men and their white wives and girlfriends. Uh, and they quickly attracted a jeering crowd. And that resulted in, in a fight, eventually in the firing of guns. And from then, there was a running street fight uh, that, that continued long, long into the night. Pictures taken at the time show some of the injuries sustained by the residents of Tiger Bay. There were two attacks on boarding houses and at one boarding house, a man called Mohammed Abdullah suffered severe injuries to his head, fractured skull and later died in the infirmary. This sounds absolutely horrific and it must have been terrifying for people caught up in it. The attacks of 1919 are still remembered by the people of Cardiff. Izzy is on her way to meet local artist Kyle Legal, who grew up in the area of Tiger Bay. His ancestors lived through the lawlessness and he's bringing a new perspective by telling the story in the form of a graphic novel. Have there been stories passed down through the generations and accounts of what happened in 1919? In my family in particular, my aunt Gaynor remembers her nan um, having al Alzheimer's and dementia late in her life and she'd scream out, cover, uh, cover the babies and get the bricks. And what she was referring to as her memory as a child, mm -hmm. where during the riots, the men would be out on patrol um, and the women would sort of arm themselves with bricks in case anybody broke into the houses where they were sort of raided by white people to 
not thinking that there was a black person living there. Kyle's graphic novel tells the story from the perspective of the residents of Tiger Bay who fought to protect their families and homes. How does knowing all these stories make you feel? Me knowing the story since I was a child and then sort of being able to tell my son, we fought for this, this place, if you know what I mean, and, um, and we're, su we're successful. I think um, the fact that we're he still here today shows that. And um, one of the things that most inspires me, I, I think, completing a project, it sort of brings the past to life. I suppose the danger of history repeating itself is a fear that people sort of see within um, the modern times. The racist violence of 1919 is an important story in the history of Tiger Bay that still resonates powerfully in today's multicultural Cardiff. The Welsh weather has, until now, been blue skies and sunshine. But today's drizzly rain isn't dampening Tim's enthusiasm. Oh, no. Now, even though it's a bit grey out there now and it's been pouring, I'm quite chuffed because I've managed to pick up a few interesting items. So I'm, I'm hopeful after the last shop, which was a fantastic start, that the next shop might have some treasure. So let's see what happens. Tim's next destination is a market town in the Vale of Glamorgan, Cowbridge. He's here to have a rummage in the Happy Days home store. Sounds nice. Oh, here we are. 30 cellars under one roof. I hope it's a dry roof. <laughs> I spy with my little eye a little eye. <laughs> but it's not mine. Look at that, a Victorian prosthetic glass eye. That's incredible. Oh, no, that's put me right off. That's quite nice. I like this. I've always loved stained glass panels and windows. If you go into a, a lovely old church and you see those beautiful colours shining through, um, and it looks quite dull like this when there's no light on it, but look, if you pick it up and hold it up to the light, look at that. It just absolutely comes alive. Um, and it's full of a story. Look, at the top there, you've got what looks like a helmet. On the left is the bishop's mitre, and on the right is the crozier, and in the middle is Cross Calvary um, below the eye of God, and then the rampant lion. And there's so much going on in this window. So at £125, I'd quite like to take that to auction, I think. I like it. Can Tim earn himself a discount from shop owner Owen? Owen. Yes, sir. I've had a good old look round and I've found this rather nice stained glass window. Very so, nice. Um, it's priced at £125, so I'll pop the money there for you. Lovely. And uh, see if I can get it in the car. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so Take much. Take care. Take, Take care. care. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. He didn't even haggle. Tim must be desperate to get home for his tea. And he's not the only one salivating at the thought of a well-earned dinner. In my mind, I thought we could get some potatoes, wrap them in foil and cook them in the embers of the campfire. Ooh. And then tin of beans. That'd be nice. Oh, and then, of course, you need some cheese. I'm well up for that. So I just need to find some jacket potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> I think my tummy's rumbling a bit too. <laughs> Nighty night. The sun is shining once again upon the glorious Welsh countryside and all is right with the world. Well, almost everything. Where's Bumblebee? Basically, Bumblebee is confirmed. What? I think Bumblebee will be back. Uh, but so. for now, we've got Bumblebee's old, older brother. We probably ought to christen our new little car. What about Bluebell? Bumblebee and Bluebell. Oh, I like that. That's a, that's a match made in heaven, isn't it? Bluebell is a 1950s left-hand drive Fiat 500, made in the time before seat belts were mandatory. I love it, I have to say, although I'm not quite sure about this left-hand drive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you know what? It feels like I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday, Izzy splashed the cash on two lots, the ornate Victorian umbrella stand and two antique maps. It's certainly before sat-nav. She still has just under £700 to spend. Roger Rodent, otherwise known as Tim, has just over £1,125. He bought the cast iron railway sign and clip, William Gladstone commemorative medal, railway maps, and stained glass window. 
I'd quite like to take that to auction, I think. I only bought two items yesterday, so I feel like I've got a bit of work to do. Well, I bought four items. Although, um, it's quite funny, actually. I've got over £1,000 to spend. Oh, hilarious. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I think that may be a fake laugh. After dropping off Tim, Izzy has continued on her merry way to the town of Annan Ford. Where, located inside of Victorian era hall, is the Annan Ford Antique Centre. Home to a multitude of dealers, it's exactly Izzy's cup of tea. For her, this antique emporium is a house of fun. Whee! Right, I've got a lot of work to do to catch Tim up. You certainly do, so you'd better get on your bike. Uh, <laughs> I mean, get off your bike, or rather, let's just scuttle along. This is the Victorian brass coal scuttle. And what I like about this one is you've got the lid, You've also got the liner inside. And there's something about this that I just think is really simple, really charming, but it's also still usable. We still have fires. Someone could have this and use it as a coal scuttle, or they might simply have it on display. Now, it's priced at £78. Probably at auction, you're looking at about that sort of price. So I'd hope that I could make, perhaps get a little bit of money off it, but I'm gonna turn up the Izzy Charm to full volume. It's full whack, and I'm just gonna see what I can get off this. Izzy is about to unleash a charm offensive upon owner Deborah. Prepare to be dazzled by the charisma and allure of Ms. Balmer. Deborah, I found this wonderful coal scuttle. It's priced at £78, but I'm not going to haggle. I just wondered what was the absolute best you could do on it. Because it is such a lovely uh, early example, I think probably 70 would be the... 70 is the 70 best. Is the best well, yeah. I said I'm not going to haggle, so I won't. So thank you very, very much. In life, there's some things you can't put a price on, and charm is one, unless you're Izzy, whose charm is worth exactly £8. She has just over £625 in her pocket, though. Meanwhile, Tim has made his way to the ancient town of Carmarthen. Its history stretches back to before the Roman conquest of Britain, and it has ties to the legend of King Arthur. Indeed, some say Merlin was born around these parts. Tim, however, is here to meet Merered Hotwood, a Welsh language poet. You must be Merered. That's right, and you're Tim. I am. Lovely to meet you. Croeso i Gerfyrddin. Welcome to Carmarthen. Merered will be telling Tim a little about the history of the Welsh language and a man who helped keep it alive after it had been banned and suppressed for centuries. What a beautiful stained glass window. I love all of the colours. It's so bright and vibrant. It's full of Welsh language proverbs. The big words you find, the big lettering in Wyneb Hail, Asagad Goleini, in the face of the sun and in the eye of the light. And you can see that big image of the light. And then the three sunbeams shining down, Cyfiawnder, Cariad, Aguirionez, which is justice, love and truth. So things, you know, noble things like um, Cenedl Heb Iaith, Cenedl Heb Galon, which means a people without a language is a people without a heart. A sentiment understood by Henry VIII. In 1543, he took control of Wales and outlawed the language from being spoken by those in public office. And what happened then, of course, is that the language lost its status. Now, suddenly, it was all about the English language. And then, even in the 19th century, children in Wales, if they were caught speaking Welsh in school, they were made to wear this plaque with WN, Welsh not on it, and they were caned for speaking the language of their homes. It's been an ugly story, and yet we're still here telling the tale. And the reason the Welsh language survived was largely due to Yola Morganwig, an 18th century poet and scholar. He was a mysterious and eccentric character, he dedicated his life to restoring the nation's pride in its language. Who was Yolo Morganol? A once-in-a-lifetime, perhaps a once-in-a-people kind of person. And he became completely obsessed 
with the Welsh tradition of poems, of poetry, the Bardic order, and everything that belonged to that. And the plan was to organise Gorsedd y Beirth, the gathering of the poets. And that's why we're here in this hotel, because in 1819, Yolo Morganog managed to bring the Gorsedd of the Bards to Camarin. The gathering of the poets was to be a celebration of the Welsh language, the likes of which hadn't been seen for centuries. But for Yola, a simple recital wasn't enough. He created a mystical ceremony in a stone circle with supposed ties to ancient druids and Arthurian legend. Yolo's plan was to regain uh, respect for the Welsh poetic tradition and indeed the Welsh language. So this is a Gorsedd circle, a circle of stones where the Gorsedd of the poets meets. The archdruid stands on the mine sorg there and then says a poem, specially written for the occasion. And then the people who are accepted into the Gorsedd that day, that year, uh, are invited to come through uh, the circle and essentially set a competition. Uh, and then the winning poet uh, was given a chair. And, and that happens to this day. Mererid became the first woman to win the Bardic chair in 2001. Wow, look at this. This is a wonderful looking chair, or should I say throne, because I can see a crown as well. They're sort of separate and together, if you like. Uh, we call it a chair, a gadair, the chair, and this is what, what you win. And you'll see on top of it those three rays of light yes. uh, that we saw in the stained glass window. And then the crown, uh, again, that's a prize. There are two main poetry prizes. And on the front of the crown, you'll also see those three rays of light. Together, that makes this, the, the Nord Orsedd, the sign of the Gorsedd, again an invention by Yolo Morgani. The Welsh people are proud of their unique language. And whilst many local historians today frown on Yola's combination of fable with historical fact, his gathering of the bards undoubtedly helped the language survive. Izzy is on her way to the final shop, but the race is on. Tim is heading for the same location. I really, oh, I don't really, I get a bit panicked because what if he gets there before me and he spots all the amazing items? So that's a bit stressful. Just hopefully I find something before Tim that's going to make me a huge profit. Izzy and Tim are heading to the town of Newcastle Emlyn in West Wales. Izzy's won the race. She'll be first through the door at the Emlyn Antique Centre. Chock full of quirky curio, collectibles and trinkets to take your breath away. <gasps> I absolutely love breakfast and here is the sweetest little breakfast set I've ever seen. This is incredible. I love the nature theme going on here. So the whole set is on a leaf design and you've got here a toast rack with a flower at the end and then you've got the handle which has got flowers and leaves on it and then here at the opposite end you've got the cruet set so you've the salt the pepper and your mustard and then in the center this beautiful pansy dish which i guess really could hold anything that is so pretty and it's priced at 55 pounds which doesn't seem unreasonable at all whether i can make a profit on it at auction is another matter but this is almost too pretty not to buy. It may be pretty, but is there a profit in it? This is a lovely nine carat rose gold arts and crafts pendant necklace. I was looking at the back, hoping that it would perhaps be a Mel Bennett or an Archibald Knox, any number of one of the big names that you look for. Now, it does have a maker's mark of H and S, which I'd have to look into and do a bit of research on. It's not someone I know off the top of my head. I guess it's Edwardian, it's turn of the century, you sort of tail end of arts and crafts and then you've got your Art Nouveau influences there as well. Now, let's have a look at the price. £170. Oh, it's where I go for a risk. I'm not sure I'm a risk taker. This is, this is hard, I'm having an inner battle here. I will pop this here and uh, have a little think, have a little wander and see what else I come across. 
Ah, here comes Tim, hot-footing it in, a man who lives by the motto of why browse when you can have a right good rummage? And why rummage when you can get proper stuck in? <laughs> Timothy Medhurst. <laughs> I found the village idiot. <laughs> Have you found anything to buy? I just need to make some decisions. I know, me too. Mm, to well, stock or not to stock? Oh dear, on that note, I'm going to leave you to it. See you later. later. I'm going to try again. Help. Tim's arrival has banished Izzy's indecision. Can she do a deal for the breakfast set and arts and crafts necklace with shopkeeper Nell? You have a really beautiful Arts and Crafts Art Nouveau nine carat gold pendant. Yes. It's ticketed at 170. What would be the absolute best you could do that for? 140. The breakfast set is at 58 pounds. 45. So that's 185. If I were to buy the two, is there it can I squeeze for any more movement or is that I think I might have to stick at 185. That's fine, two. no problem. Sorry. I thought I'd just try my luck, you know, from one redhead to another. <laughs> Izzy has purchased her final items. She spent £140 on the necklace and £45 on the breakfast set. Tim's still got some shopping to do, though. Look at these. They are absolutely beautiful. We've got a late Victorian silk dress with beautiful beadwork sewn in here. And this one over here, look at that. Silk dress again. Um, dating to the 19th century, and you can imagine a Victorian lady wearing that um, in the parlour or the ballroom, and it's just beautiful, isn't it? Look at that green, and you'd imagine the original colour might be a lot more vivid. However, the way it's made is just exquisite, isn't it? Lovely little silk buttons there as well, and the frills. I don't really know what these would be worth, but I can imagine together as a group, they would sell quite well. They look very well displayed on the stands. There's no ticket prices on the dresses. Shop manager Eliza is the lady to ask. How much would they be if I took the two? £200. £200. Do you think if I took the two together, you could squeeze to 180? I should think so. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll be very pleased to take those on. <laughs> I'm not sure which one will fit that. <laughs> I think the green would set off your eyes beautifully, Tim, but you can have your pick. For £180, Tim's bought the two Victorian dresses. After you, madam. We barely had time to catch our breath after another spectacular antique shopping spree. Do you feel like the day we've had has aged you a little bit? No, because you make me feel young, Tim. Together, we make quite a good team, don't we? I think so. Perfect duo. Absolutely. The antique trippers. No. <laughs> the, the, Tim, the... we could do a better name <laughs> than that. Come on. <laughs> the trippy antiquers. The, uh... No. I've always been partial to voyages of antiquity. Toodle pip. It's auction time and Bumblebee is back on the road. At previous auctions, Izzy and Tim have enjoyed exhilarating highs and demoralising lows. Which way will the merciless auction pendulum swing today? Wow, look at that place, Izzy. Ooh. You've taken me to your castle. You're the <laughs> queen of the castle. You can be the king of the castle or the court jester. Oh, this is a nail-biting auction, this is. Tim and Izzy have arrived at Picton Castle in West Wales, one of the country's finest stately homes. <laughs> Whoa, racing to get to this fire. Oh, you can't wait to get next to that heat, can you? I oh. cannot. Ah, nice and toasty look. They've sent their items to Edinburgh, where they will go up for auction online and over the phone at Ramsey Cornish Auctioneers and Valuers. Izzy spent a total of £330 on her five lots. Which one does auctioneer Martin Cornish think has the greatest profit potential? I think the Edwardian Arts and Crafts pendant will probably do best of all. It's gold, it's got semi-precious stones in it, it's in nice condition, so I think certainly it will be probably the one that will do the best. Tim spent £610 on his five lots. Which one has caught Martin's expert eye? Gladstone medals in nice condition, 
it's not been over cleaned and polished. I think there will definitely be some collectors and people that are interested in it. I'm very excited about this auction. It could be the sort of make or break this one, couldn't it? I mean, you have got quite a lot of money, so even if it's a break for you, I think you're still going to be well, you're not, furloughs ahead of me. You're not doing too badly yourself. Well, very best of luck. Thank you. you May too. the best woman win. <laughs> <laughs> first up, Tim's stained glass window. Do you like stained glass? Amazing how it shines through, isn't it? I Beautiful love colours. stained glass. Let's start the bidding at £30, the lovely stained glass panel. Oh, no. £30 for it. There you go. That's a lot of stained glass for £30. It is. 35 at Yes. Oh, it's, it's creeping up. It's climbing, isn't it? Climbing. At 55 at 55 60 You might yet yeah, get out of deep water here, Tim. Really Very deep water. At 70 mm. At 75 now. It's still going. You want to come in at 90 now. At ninety pounds. One more bid, surely. One hundred. He's at trying 100. hard. Yes. Isn't he? At one hundred. And I'm selling last call. At no. Yes. No. No. Sold one hundred. The internet bidder. That's a lot of money chucked out of the window for Tim. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, dear. Tim. That didn't sound sincere, did it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Not. <laughs> Can Izzy do better with her Victorian umbrella stand? I'm hoping it's sort of 80. Yeah, it should be between 60 and 100, I should think. 80. 80, yeah, that is between <laughs> 60 and 100. There we are. <laughs> 40 pounds, I'm bid. 50, 55. Oh, in the profit. Relief. <laughs> 75, 80. At 80 pounds. It's as if I'm an auctioneer. <laughs> for this lot, at 80, and I'm going to sell it at 80. He's selling for 80, 80 as well. No other offers. <laughs> at 80. Sold 80 pounds. The brolly stand turned a tidy profit. Save that for a rainy day, eh? That sold between 60 and 100 pounds. Very good. Well done, Tim. <laughs> Next lot, the Victorian silk dresses. Would you have bought these yourself, Izzy? These dresses? I actually would have done because I really love fashion. So, yeah, I think they're a really good buy and I really hope they do well for you. At 110 now, 120. Oh, they're 20. getting there. Keep going at 130. At 130. Oh, come on, a little bit more. Don't still the there. Mannequins as well. At 130 pounds. I don't think that's too much. No, I don't. Two dresses, two sell mannequins. At 130. Sold to the inset bidder. Ah, so far, this auction is a real dressing down for Tim. Oh, I'm really sorry. It's not my day, is it? Someone's got oh. a bargain. Will Izzy's breakfast set cut the mustard? I think it's probably one of the nicer compendium, breakfast compendium almost, isn't it? I'm like, breakfast set, and you're like, compendium. At £30. £30, I'm bid. And what did you pay? £45. 35, 40, 50. At Ooh, £50. Pounds, good. At £50. Pounds. Imagine that in your breakfast. Yeah, imagine it. Morning. Bid again. <laughs> at £55. At £55. At £60. Well at done, 60. you. £60. £60. At 60, and I'm selling it at 60 Sold. Izzy's on a roll. Three lots in a row, turning a tidy profit. Well done. That Thank was a you. really nice little thing, that. I liked Thank it. Thank you. Can Tim get in on the profits with his collection of vintage railway maps? My favourite one's a 1950s one, and it's the Underground in London. Ooh. And it's just quite cool. And he can start the bidding at £50. Pounds. £50. Pounds. No. Nope. Should we start the bidding What? At 30, <gasps> no! <laughs> We're at 35. Thank oh, this is slow going, isn't it? I'm really surprised because Railway Arna train memorabilia is always a sure win. At 35. No! You have it, 35. Oh, dear. Tim's day continues to go off the rails. £35. I literally can't believe that. It's time for Izzy's maps to go under the hammer. Now, I bought big maps and you bought small maps, didn't you? Not all about size, <laughs> Timothy. <laughs> At £20. Ooh. Has he got a bit of 20 £20. I'm have I? Ordnance and survey map. At £20. Ooh, yes, let's oh, have Oh, they could do bit. a little bit more than that, couldn't they? Pounds. Come on. At £20. 20. Oh, no. Oh. Sold. 20 and There's no love for maps at today's auction. I'm not laughing because you lost money. No, of course not. Of course not. You're Mr Supportive. Tim's William Gladstone commemorative medal is next. Would you have bought it if you'd seen it? 100%. Oh, glad I saw it first then. I've got 50 pounds straight in. Ooh. 50. I've doubled up. At 50 pounds, I reckon. At 
50. Last call at 50 oh. pounds at 50 pounds. Sold to the internet bidder. Last, a profit for Tim. That's cheaper than I thought. But it's still double my money, so yeah. I'm chuffed. I'm Absolutely. Happy. Up next is his cold bucket. Out of all my purchases, this is probably the one I'm the most worried about. Well, I like the look of it. I think it's quite a stylish thing. I can see why you bought it. Yes. Fingers crossed, hey? £20 I'm bid for the cold bucket or cold bucket. Oh, come on, is it? £20. £20. £25, that's a bit better. At 25, They've got another bidder. At 25 Oh, at come 25, on. At £30. At £30. I'm going to sell it. Nobody else going oh, on. Oh, is he? Oh. Sold. 30 that's Izzy's winning streak well and truly scuttled. Oh, I'm really disappointed with that, Tim, because... I am genuinely disappointed for you. You look it. <laughs> All aboard. It's Tim's final lot, the cast iron railway sign and clip. Now, the only unfortunate thing is, is that I paid £200 for them. It's all that money. You thought, yeah, oh, I know. you I know, spending it here and here. <laughs> I can start the At £50. 50? Pounds. 50? Oh, no. 50 pounds is me. Come on, bid, is he? The it's the sleeper 60. train, Tim. It's <laughs> going to get there. <laughs> it's at 80 pounds on the internet. I paid 200 pounds for these, is he? I was hoping it would be a runaway train. Pounds. 85, last call. Sold to the phone bidder. Tim's arrived at his final stop, Desolation Station. 85 pounds. I'm trying not to smile. Oh, I'm taking a I'm hammering. trying really hard not to <laughs> smile. <laughs> Last but not least, Izzy's arts and crafts necklace. I genuinely would happily own this myself, so I'm just hoping that at least two other people think the same. Absolutely. Only takes two to tango. And it's at 65, 70. 75, 80 with me, 85, 90. Always oh, climbing quickly. I'm holding my breath until we get to 140. 140, 150. Oh, I can breathe. <laughs> well done. 220 now. Does anybody else... I knew exactly what I was doing. 220. Yeah, come on, someone else come in. It's on the internet at 240 and I'm selling... I got wow. excited then. Sold £240. That is an impressive profit for Izzy. I'm so delighted, Tim. £240, £100 profit. That's incredible. Thank you. It's been a bad day for Tim. After auction costs, he's lost a heartbreaking £282. He's still left with a considerable £1,275.26p. After sale room fees, Izzy's made £22.60p. She now is the proud custodian of £792.74p. Wow. Wow, Tim, what a roller coaster. Your pendant, amazing. But your dresses. I can't remember what they made. They made a loss. They made a loss. <laughs> I'm so glad you're finding my losses so funny. I'm so <laughs> I just need a moment to compose myself and put on my supportive face. <laughs>